for what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. Father, you spoke and the creation came into being. And the psalmist looks at the cosmos, he looks at the stars, the moon, the sun. He bursts out into worship and says, this is your handiwork. At your name, Abba, the creation shakes. The mountains bow down, the earth gives way, the waters roar at the sound of your name. How magnificent are you? How wondrous are your works? If we were to count, Lord, even the sky will not be a parchment enough. And oceans will fall short as ink. How great and marvelous you are. You are sovereign over all. Our lives, our situations, our circumstances. You know our deepest desires, our yearnings, our strivings, our, our pain, our joys. You are well acquainted, even better than we are with our own needs and desires. So we come before you this morning and we ask you to speak. Speak into our lives, our joys, our concerns, our predicaments. Speak, Abba. We want to hear from you. Because you alone have the answers. You alone are the answer. Speak. We are listening. Speak to us, for we are your people called by your name. This is your word. This is your church. Speak, for I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. How are you all doing this morning? Oh, none of you had breakfast. How many of you are fasting today? And still... Come on, how are you doing this morning? All right, that's slightly better. Good, my name is Joy and I'm the pastor here. I want to welcome you all. I see a lot of familiar faces and I see a lot of not so familiar faces. So please give me a chance to, to say hello to you, to meet you, to see how we can best serve you. Uh, if you go outside on our welcome desk, there's a QR code. You can scan that, leave us your details so that we can stay in touch with you and inform you what's happening in the life of our family. There are some hoodies there. If you want to purchase hoodies, um, that, that has a great uh, slogan in front, our logo at the back. It's our merchandise. That's there. That's $12.99. Some of you left the sizes. We, weren't, we didn't have enough sizes. We'll, we'll stay in touch with you and let you know when that's available. But you can do that outside. Now, we've been announcing and we've been playing football for now, it's the third time we played yesterday. You see, we have only a very short window in the city to play football. You know, December, but December goes and Christmas, we eat a lot. So, you know, football is not possible when you're eating a lot. So, technically, we have a window from January till about, stretch it too far, April first week. You know, April itself gets really hot, so January to about end of March. So, we've already played thrice. Every two weeks, we play on a Saturday or on a Sunday evening. Um, yesterday, we played as well. The difference was, the last two times before yesterday that we played, we had many players. Okay, we play on a smaller ground, six on six. And each time before yesterday we played, we had, you know, four to five substitutes to play with. You know, we could do our thing, 10 minutes, flash in the pan, you know, sprint, come out and take 15 minutes to recover from that sprint. So we could do that in the last two times. 
right? But yesterday was different. We only had 14 players and two kids. So we had, at best, one substitute each team, right? In total, we would have played for about 75 minutes. That means you do the math, each player must have played for about 45 to 50 minutes. Surprisingly, yesterday, the game was unusually and painfully slow. Okay, we could easily see easy goals missing. You know, the, the, the goalkeeper is daydreaming and we are kicking the ball somewhere else. It was just, it was just amazing. Not much effort running back to support the goalkeeper. If somebody is, you know, once in a blue moon having a long run, nobody's running parallel to take the pass. It was just amazingly slow. And that is because a lot of us did not have the stamina to play that long, even 50 minutes. We had, you know, players ranging from 7, 8 years old all the way to 45 years old. I was somewhere in the middle, not towards 45. But the fact is not all of us had the stamina to pull through that 50 minutes of game. And to, the, to, to add to the woe of lack of stamina was the heat. We thought it's a beautiful February morning, you know, starting at 11 a.m., going all the way to 12.30, it'll be nice, it'll be beautiful, it'll be sunny, we'll enjoy the game. But it was hot. It was really, really hot. We had an injury here and there. We had shoe accidents, people playing in their socks, nail chipping. Some of us are missing today, not here. See, all the factors, heat, circumstances, conditions, injury, lack of stamina, made even the best of us fall flat on our back. See, as you know, sports require stamina. You name the sport, you require stamina. Badminton, cricket, squash, rowing, even table tennis requires a lot of stamina. Every sport requires you to train consistently to last all the way. Not only do you train for the sport, you train, you build stamina, you cultivate stamina to even endure the circumstances and the conditions under which you play. See, not just sports, even the life of faith requires stamina. It is not a flash in the pan. It is not a 10-minute sprint. It's a marathon. It's a 120-minute football game, not just 90 minutes. There are times when you're required to walk or stroll, and there are times when you are sprinting, but most of it is slow progression like a marathon. We need to develop muscles, we need to endure the circumstances and conditions, and we need to train hard to last the stretch. We want to reach the end on our two feet. If we do not cultivate that stamina, if we do not build those muscles and develop and cultivate the endurance to, to last the game, we will burn out, we will crash, we will get derailed. And worst is, some of us might quit. See, unlike our sports, it doesn't matter in the life of faith whether you reach first, second, or third, provided you reach there on your two feet. And that requires stamina. That requires cultivation of stamina. And so this morning, as we go back to our series in the Gospel of Mark, No Turning Back, I want to ask and answer the question, how can we then cultivate stamina for the life of faith? How can we then build these muscles, endurance, to survive in the conditions, to reach the end, to last long? And I want to look for a solution in Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 25. As you flip the pages or your gadgets to reach that chapter, let me tell you three things we'll be looking for. We'll be looking for an unexpected entry, an unexpected encounter, and an unexpected solution. Unexpected entry, encounter, and solution. Last week, just to refresh your memories, we looked at disciples' misjudgment 
and misunderstanding of Jesus' mission. They think Jesus is going to Jerusalem to establish his rule and his authority. That means glory for them in contrast with the blind man Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus sees Jesus despite of being blind for who he is, what his mission is. The moment he receives grace from Jesus, he starts following him and serve him. Jesus says, I have come not to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. And Jesus says, your mission as my disciples, as my followers is the same. And this week, we pick up our story from 11, chapter 11, verse 1. Now, as they approached Jerusalem near Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go to the village ahead of you. As soon as you enter it, you will find a cold tide there that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. Now, Jesus sends two of his disciples ahead, and he says, get me a ride. Fetch me a ride, a colt. You see, a colt is a young donkey as opposed to a steed or a fully grown horse. A young, uh, not young donkey, young horse, who's smaller compared to a fully grown horse. And Jesus says, go fetch my ride. You know, the strange thing there is, Jesus has come all the way from Galilee to Bethany, which is about 190 kilometers. He has come walking. And Bethany or Bethpage is about four kilometers out of Jerusalem. The strange thing is Jesus walked all the way 190 kilometers and just for the four kilometers, the last stretch, Jesus wants a ride. Why is that? Why is Jesus looking for a ride? We'll come back to that. So Jesus sends his disciples. He tells them, okay, this is, this is, this is what's going to happen. You're going to look for a colt. You'll find a colt. That colt has never been ridden before. Untie it and bring it back to me. If the people there, the owner, ask you what you're doing, just tell them the Lord wants it for his service. And they'll let you go. Whatever Jesus said exactly, that's the way it happens. They go, they untie the colt. Bystanders see them, ask them what you're doing. And they say, the Lord wants it. And they let them go. But you're going to pause and ask, Mark, why are you giving us such mundane details? You know, as an author, why are you going into so many details in this particular paragraph? And some of the details seem inconsequential. Why are you doing that? You've got to go back to Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. It's a prophecy. It says, rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is legitimate and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a young donkey, the foal of a female donkey. Look, your king is coming to you. The Greek word there says donkey is actually the same word here, colt. Mark is saying, look at Jesus riding this colt, marching into Jerusalem. He is your king. This is the neon sign. This is what the Old Testament has been talking about. He's the person the Old Testament has been pointing towards. He's your king. Watch out for him. You see, at that time, there was a tradition called Angaria. And according to that tradition, any and every animal could be um, used for someone significant could be impressed upon, could be used for someone significant during some emergency or some need. And, and Jesus saying that tell the people that the Lord needs it is quite bold. Jesus saying that God himself requires this cold because he will ride it. And Jerusalem must come out to receive their king. Jerusalem must come out because this is the Messiah they've been waiting for. This is the king that they've been yearning for. He's the one who's going to redeem them. He's the one who's going to set them free and give them the freedom that they've been waiting for for centuries now. All the prophecies in Isaiah, all the way from Genesis. Genesis 49 tells you that, that the king, will, the chosen one, will ride in on a colt. All the way from there till now, they have been awaiting. So Jerusalem must go out. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing at times, uh, if you frequent to airports, 
to see how people receive people. You know, at times it's a funny sight. You know, see all the garlands and dholak and drums and all of that is going on. No matter how insignificant the person is, but to that family, that person means a lot. So it's this amazing sight to behold. It's funny at times, but it's just mesmerizing at times. And when we came back from Australia after being three years there, we had a lot of family and friends show up. It was just a, a sight to behold. You know, it filled our hearts with joy that, you know, people cherish us, people love us. The other thing is, when we came back from the U.S., hardly anybody was there. That's a whole other thing. I don't know why, but some were there. Still good. But the fact is that even for somebody as insignificant as us, people were there waiting for us. How much more for Jesus? How much more for Jesus should the city, should his own capital, his place of rule where his throne will be, how much more his palace, his people should come out? And as you go on, verse 8 onwards, you see people are singing Hosanna, Hosanna. People are putting their cloaks. People are putting their branches in, in front of him. And you're like, yes, they get it. They're singing Psalm 118, which is a praise psalm where, where people are praising God for his redemption, past, future, and present. And you think, yes, Jerusalem gets it. Jesus is finally being acknowledged for who he is, the real king, the king of all kings. But if you look closely, the people who are singing and shouting are not from Jerusalem. They are Jesus' disciples. And at best, these are people who have seen Jesus heal Bartimaeus. And so they are following him. Jesus enters Jerusalem. And the city is sleeping. Nobody acknowledges him. You want to see the biggest upset? Verse 11. The anticlimax. Then Jesus entered Jerusalem. Wow. This is the moment. This is the time. Disciples all through the journey have been anticipating and waiting expectantly for Jesus to step into Jerusalem because the moment he does that, he'll be enthroned the king. The king of Jews. Then Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple and after looking around at everything, he went out to Bethany with the twelve since it was already late. What an anticlimax. What an end to the most anticipated journey. Nothing. Nothing. Nobody at the airport to receive Jesus. Nobody at the airport. The city would have acknowledged Jesus if he would have come riding a war horse with a host of angels. The city would have recognized Jesus if he would have come with fireworks, with signs and wonders. But this king rides on a young horse, not even a war horse, with a riffraff around him as per the Jerusalem standards. Humble, meek. It's like the prime minister of India coming to a rally in a rundown Maruti 800 with people of no social standing or significance, instead of his murk and the cavalcade. The city fails to recognize Jesus because he does not fit their grid of a leader, let alone a king. And I think at times we fail to recognize, acknowledge him for who he is. For a lot of us, Jesus has already, metaphorically speaking, marched into our lives. And yet we fail to acknowledge him and recognize him for who he is every day in our lives. C.S. Lewis, the great author in his book, Mere Christianity, he said, Jesus is either a lunatic or a liar for making such claims. The claims of grandeur, the claims of being the son of God and God himself. And then he says, or he is perhaps the Lord. He says, you must truly make your choice. Either this man was and is 
the son of God or else a madman or something worse. Lewis said that he, he always produced three kinds of responses. Either hatred, terror, or adoration. He's never been just a teacher. He was never a buddy. He was never just a household name. If it was really the Lord, the King, that he demands, then he demands adoration and worship of our lives, through our lives. Either you do that or you crucify him. There is no middle ground. There is no middle ground. Either you adore him, acknowledge him, recognize him, or you crucify him. Nowhere in the Bible do you see people in the middle ground saying he's just a good teacher. So we saw Jesus' unexpected entry into Jerusalem. Now let us see the unexpected encounter Verse 12. Now the next day as they went out from Bethany, he was hungry. That is Jesus. After noticing in the distance a fig tree with leaves, he went to see if he could find any fruit on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. Why? For it was not the season for figs. He said to it, that is to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. His disciples heard it. See, this is a strange passage. In verse 11, you see Jesus coming to the temple. In verse 15, you see Jesus going back to the temple. Sandwiched between these two visitations of Jesus is this strange encounter. An encounter with the fig tree. And you've got to ask the question, what's happening here? Jesus sees the fig tree. It is not the season for the fig tree to bear fruit. Jesus still curses this tree. What's going on? Why are you doing that, Jesus? Are you just displaying your power for no real reason? Because that tree has no way to defend itself. What's going on? Press pause. We'll come back to that later. Verse 15. Then they came to Jerusalem. Jesus entered the temple area and began to drive out those who were selling and buying in the temple courts. He turned over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. Then he began to teach them and said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you, you have turned it into a den of robbers. See, this is the time of Passover. If you check the historical uh, records, it tells us that around this time, there were about 200,000 animals sacrificed. You can imagine the number of people in and around temple, going in, going out. People would come from all over Israel, from top to bottom, even across the border. And what they had to do was they had to do was to offer a sacrifice, sacrifice of a clean, unblemished, untainted animal. So it was obvious that people would not risk that by bringing an animal all the way from their house or hometown to Jerusalem. So people would buy these animals from the temple and offer them a sacrifice. Not just that, temple accepted only a certain currency. In order for people who had come across the border, they had to exchange that currency to offer or give their offerings to the temple. Hence, the money changers. That sounds normal, isn't it? It's like somebody outside of India is coming into India and at the airport, you've got to change your currency. Right? It's, it's normal. Why is Jesus so upset and antsy about this whole thing? What's going on? Is Jesus against the notion of buying and selling animals? Is he against the the notion of trade, of exchanging money? There might be some fraud going on there, but we are not aware of that. What is going on? See, in order to understand what's going on, you've got to look at the temple. You've got to understand the structure of the temple. 
The central of the temple, at the very center of it, the heart of the temple was the Holy of Holies. Where God's presence dwelt, where his mercy seat was, where the Ark of the Covenant was. Nobody could enter that space. Once a year, the high priest would enter to atone for people, sacrifices on the Day of Atonement. Outside of Holy of Holies was a precinct of priests, where the altar was, where the sacrifices were cut, priests were allowed there. And the Holy of Holies was separated by this thick veil, so that nobody can even peep inside, let alone going inside. Outside the temple precincts, the precincts of the priests, was this place for Israelites, the Jews, only the men. That's the third level. Fourth level was the place for women. Jewish women. And the outermost court, which is the largest court, was the court of the Gentiles. That is the structure of the temple. And if you see this buying and selling, this changing of money is happening in that outermost court. Where the Gentiles, the non-Jews who have willingly accepted Yahweh as their Lord and Savior, they would come and worship. And when Jesus sees that the, the, their worship is obstructed, that these Jews have become so inward focused that they are willing to put all this buying and selling and exchanging in their court, Jesus becomes livid. Not because money is being changed, not because animals are being sold, but because these Jews are creating barrier for these non-Jews to come and worship God. For namesake, they have a provision for these people to come into the temple and worship, but their attitude, their behavior, their testimony, their disposition towards this people creates a barrier, creates a roadblock rather than an on-ramp for them to meet with God. Jesus looks at it, and Jesus is angry. Jesus has taken, and he has withstood a lot of insults. He was called even the devil. But when he sees this, when he sees worship being obstructed, barriers being created, especially for the outsiders, he cannot overlook it. In saying, my house will be called the house of prayer, Jesus quotes Isaiah 56, verse 7. In Isaiah 56, God is saying to the foreigners, he's saying, I will establish you in my temple. Those who will willingly come and worship me, I will establish you in my temple. My house, my temple will be called a nation of, a house of prayer for all nations, not just Jews, for all And saying, you made this a den of robbers, Jesus is quoting Jeremiah 7. In Jeremiah 7, you have God reprimanding and rebuking the Israelites. He says, you've come on a Sunday to offer your sacrifices, to worship me. But from Monday to Saturday, you are chasing other gods. On Sunday, you come and you want to hide yourself from your troubles in my shelter, in my house. But Monday to Saturday, your life speaks volumes of your worship. And your worship is not towards me. All Jesus can see in the temple is everything but worship. Everything but worship. And he's angry that not only the people are not worshiping rightly, they are even creating barriers for those outside. See, we've got to ask ourselves as individuals, as a church, are we creating barriers for people to worship? Is our lifestyle, our choices, our demeanor, our disposition towards those outside, 
And even those inside, is it propelling them to worship? Is it leading them to, ha- to wonder about Christ or is it leading them towards negative thoughts towards Christianity? Are we creating roadblocks for people or are we creating on ramps for people to meet with Jesus? See, we need to think about this seriously and carefully. I'll tell you why. Let's go back to the fig fig tree story. In fact, move a little ahead, verses 20 and 21. You see Jesus and his disciples, after cleansing the temple, they're passing by this fig tree. And the disciples see this fig tree and they're amazed. And they say to Jesus, look, the tree you curse, it has withered, it has died, it has been uprooted. But why did Jesus curse that tree? See, the fig tree, the the season, it was not, it says, the scripture says, Mark tells us it was not really the season of fruit. Why did Jesus curse that tree? See, from a distance, it showed leaves. And that season, fig tree, when the leaves would come on, it would have little fruit. It was not a proper ripe fig, but a small fruit, a pre-fig sort of a fruit. People could still pick that and eat. So the leaves would tell you that this fruit must be there on the tree, not fully ripe, but a small fruit. And so when Jesus looks at this tree from a distance, it it looks healthy. It shows leaves. But when Jesus goes close to it, he looks at it carefully. It is a lie. It is a facade. The tree has all the semblance of bearing fruit. But there is no fruit. It is a facade. And hence Jesus curses this tree because it is a lie. And this episode, this encounter with the fig tree is an object lesson. It's a judgment that is called upon the temple. Because temple has a semblance of worship but there is no worship in it. And Jesus says, you will wither and you will die. And lo and behold, three or four decades from this time, in AD 70, the temple is destroyed. The temple is uprooted. The temple withers. Because there is no worship. There is no worship. It's serious. Jonathan Edwards, the great 18th century Puritan, in his famous sermon, Sinner at the Hands of an Angry God, he says, however you may have reformed your life in many things and may have had religious affections and may keep up a form of religion in your families and closets and in the house of God, it is nothing but his mere pleasure that keeps you from being this very moment swallowed up in everlasting destruction. He says it is nothing but his mere pleasure that keeps you from being this very moment swallowed up in everlasting destruction. He says no matter how you are, On a Sunday, no matter how well you sing, no matter how much you lift your hands, God sees you and he sees through you. He sees you from Monday to Saturday. He sees you on Sunday. He sees right through you. And he says it's only his pleasure that keeps you from being destroyed. Pleasure in us? No. Pleasure in his son. See, Romans 8, Ruth began with Romans 8. Romans 8 tells us that Jesus is interceding on our behalf. Having died, having risen again, having ascended, Jesus now stands before his father and our father and intercedes on our behalf and says, it is done. 
See, redemption is not just a thing of the past. Redemption is ongoing because every day Jesus intercedes for us and he says, take pleasure in what I have done. See, in God's sight, all are broken. Whether inside the church, outside the church, everyone is made in God's image and everyone is broken. Romans 3. But Jesus stands before his Abba and says, I have done it. Take pleasure. Take pleasure. See, our behavior towards our neighbor, our neighbor, whoever your neighbor is, is a reflection of the authenticity of our worship of God. Our behavior our demeanor, our disposition before our neighbor is a reflection of the authenticity of our worship of God. Remember that. It's not your Sunday attendance. It's not how much money you put in the offering. The fruit is shown in your disposition towards your neighbor. So we saw the unexpected entry and the unexpected encounter. Now let us look at the solution. In verse 21, we see again the disciples going and passing the tree and having seen the tree withered, Jesus says to them in verse 22, have faith because, you know, disciples are perturbed. They are they're in fear, I guess. What has happened? And Jesus says, have faith in God. In verse 23, he says, I tell you the truth. If someone says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. For this reason, I tell you, whatever you pray and ask for, believe that you have received it and it will be yours Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven will also forgive your sins. See, Jesus says you need stamina to carry on. And the only way you can have stamina to carry on is if you allow the power of God to constantly flow in to your lives. The only way you can carry on, the only way you can cultivate this stamina, the only way you can last long is you should leave the vent open, the window open for God's power to be constantly supplied in your life. And he says there's a twofold solution for that. The solution is prayer in faith and prayer with forgiveness. Prayer in faith and prayer with forgiveness. He says, do you want the power of God to be supplied in your life? Do you want to cultivate that stamina to keep walking in faith every day of your lives and finally reach the destination? He says, pray with faith. What does he mean by faith? Do I pray without faith? By faith, he means when you pray, expect the power of God to show up. He's using hyperbole. He's using metaphorical language when you're asking the mountains to go and throw themselves in the water. That represents something that is impossible. But Jesus says, when you stand and pray, expect God to show up. Expect God's power to be displayed and manifest in your lives. See, the opposite is not true. You might turn around and say, so that that means when I pray and my prayer is not answered, do I not have faith? No, opposite is not true. And that is not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying here is that when you pray with faith, when you pray expectantly, allow God's power to show up in your lives. Expect God's power to show up in your lives. Begin with prayer. The other thing he says is, if you want to, see, I drive through early Sunday morning through Chanakipuri, right, coming here. And when you're around Nehru Park, you see 
people running, whether it is four degrees in the morning or 40 degrees, you see people running. You know, some are sprinting, some are strolling, some are just jogging. And some of them you see in proper attire. You see them wearing T-shirts, you know, shorts and running shoes. And some of them you see running bare, bare feet. Some of them you see running in jeans, denims. And you know the people who are running in denim that they're not going to last long. One round of Nehru Park and that's it. You know that. Why? Because they're not in the right attire. They're they are wearing heavy clothes. They have extra weight on themselves. And unforgiveness is like that weight. It doesn't allow you to cultivate stamina. It doesn't allow you to pray properly. And Jesus is saying, if you want this stamina, if you want this power of God in your life, shed the weight that you're carrying. Shed the weight that you're carrying. When you pray, you pray with faith. When you pray with faith, you expect God's power to show up. When you, when you see God's power show up, that power allows you to set people free. Pray with forgiveness. When you pray with faith and you pray with forgiveness, you're able to cultivate that stamina through God's power to continue walking in faith, to continue serving God, to continue to show your love to your neighbor, to not get bogged down and burdened and get distracted by things around you. Not to burn out, not to crash, not to be derailed, but to move on and press on. Are you feeling powerless to continue in your faith? Do you feel that when you come on Sunday morning, your lips are singing, but your heart is out of rhythm? It's out of tune. There's a dissonance between your lips and your heart. Are you finding it hard to be in the world? Are you battling addictions? You and I need the power of God to show up in our lives. Jesus says, start from prayer. Begin with asking God to reinvigorate in you the desire to desire him. Because if you do not have that desire, there is no stamina. Jesus says, start with prayer. Don't stop. There are other things you can incorporate and you should. But he's saying, if you want the power of God, if you're feeling powerless, start with prayer. Ask God in faith and expect him to show up. See, we celebrate communion every Sunday. Not just first Sunday, not just any Sunday, but every Sunday. Because we believe that there is more precedence in the Bible to celebrate communion every time we meet than one Sunday of the month. And if you have not received the cup, our dear friend Angam here is passing. Please take it, raise your hand, and he'll bring it to you and even upstairs. See, the communion is this beautiful reminder. It is a reminder for us to see what happened, to remember that our redemption, while it cost Jesus a lot, came to us at no cost. We remember every Sunday, lest we cheapen the grace. We celebrate communion every Sunday to remember that Jesus died for humanity, not just for you and me. And it is our role to love others and not look down upon them. 
See, we've been talking about prayer. There's one big prayer that remains unanswered in the New Testament. And that is the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. What does he pray? Lord, take this cup away from me. Take this cup away from me, if you will. But not my will, yours be done. Guess what's the answer to that prayer? The father says, no. You got to drink that cup. You got to drink that cup. And here is the king of this creation, all alone on the cross, betrayed even by his closest, stands alone, hangs alone. See, while the prayer was unanswered, God's power was supplied. God's power for Jesus to drink that cup. And that is the prayer of faith. That is a prayer of faith. It might not come as an answer to what the way you expect it, but God's power shows up. Either he'll take the cup away or he'll give you the strength to drink the cup. We thank God for that unanswered prayer. Because if that prayer would have been answered, we would not be here. And we thank God for his power, his strength, supplied amply for Jesus in his darkest hour. So this communion is a reminder for us that Jesus went all the way, all the way for us. And even now, he stands before his Father and intercedes for us. So before we partake of this communion, let us spend some moments in silence, introspecting on our lives, seeing if there is any weight in us that slows us down, that's weighing us down, that is hindering our stamina to be cultivated. Father, I ask as people pray, would your power show up to help them release people? There are some here who have so much bitterness in their hearts against people, people who have disappointed them, betrayed them, rejected them. Lord, would you enable forgiveness? Lord, would you enable your power to show up in their lives to release and be set free to run freely the race that is marked out for them. Let's eat the bread together. Let's drink the cup together. Now may the love of God the Father, the grace, the extravagant grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the constant communion and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of us through this week and even forevermore. For I ask for the glory and the kingdom and the dominion of the Father, in the name of our great high priest, the one who even now stands before our Father and intercedes for us, even Lord Jesus. And by the power 
of the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless. Have a great week ahead. God willing, we'll see you next week.